Hej, välkommen, välkomna till eh, kvällens föredrag som har eh, rubriken Livstidsråd för cancerdrabbade. Eh, jag heter Torbjörn Sassersson och jag kommer från eh, TV Hälsa som är en norsk ägd TV eh, hälsotidning som har en svensk upplaga. Och vi är några stycken som jobbar här i Sverige. Vi har hållit på med tidningen här i Sverige sedan 2016 och eh, motsvarande tidning på norska då i, i eh, i eh, Norge har jag funnits lite längre. Eh, och vi har då äran att få vara värd för eh, professor Robert Thomas ikväll. En unik eh, skolmedicinare på så vis att han är även intresserad av naturlig läkning. Eh, han, har, han har forskat eh, mycket på då, livstid och livstidsråd för cancerdrabbare framförallt. Och problemet som den här typen av forskning har då i, i samhället och i världen det är att den inte går att patentera. Så det finns ett visst naturligt motstånd då från den etablerade vården att ta till sig de här kunskaperna. Likväl så fungerar de här råden och livstidsråden väldigt väl. Eh, och eh, han har skrivit en bok också som heter Keep Healthy After Cancer. Eh, så han är även författare. Och jag ska nu överlämna eh, ordet till Robert Thomas. You're welcome to take the stage tonight. So I'm a, an oncologist, I'm a mainstream oncologist, but I specialize in ex exercise and nutrition and how they can help patients with cancer. There's still a lot of confusion amongst the general public and patients what they should do to protect themselves from cancer and help their cancer treatments. In the past this was because they didn't have enough information. Now I think it's because they're getting too much information and they're ending up confused. The confusion also is with the doctors as well as the patients. So patients are forced to get unconfirmed information, some of which could be wrong. So what we do in our research department is try to find the information, the correct information from clinical studies, so we can empower patients to make the right choices. So we design studies and we publish them in medical journals. We also publish them in sports journals and uh, we advise most of the cancer charities in the UK what they should include in their leaflets. And also we, um, we write books and things like that. Most importantly, we try to engage with the public through um, blogs, looking at different articles, newsletters, including one last week, how to boost your immunity to help protect yourself from coronavirus, very topical. And if we get questions from patients, we try to do an evidence um, search and put it on our blog, such as the recent excitement about cannabis, we've done an evidence review, or whether you should fast during chemotherapy. And these are the six main priorities Obesity, gut health, inflammation, sugar, exercise, and polyphenol-rich foods. So starting with obesity, it's not actually such a problem being overweight if you're otherwise healthy. The main problem if you have a low muscle mass and you are overweight, and that's called sarcopenic obesity. And these patients do very badly on chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and have a poor prognosis. And it's the most important thing is exercise because it will increase muscle mass even if the weight stays the same. In fact, the three best tips to keep your weight down, are, which are evidence-based, are 13 hours of fasting overnight, exercising before breakfast, so try to extend the gap between meals. And probably the more significant risk for obesity is sugar 
over fat. The problem is with sugar, you get a nice increase in blood sugar after eating it. And then the blood sugar drops an hour later and you get hungry again, you eat more. So you're constantly eating if you eat sugar, processed sugar. In fact, the biggest um, link to high cholesterol now is thought to be sugar, not fat intake. Um, I'm not talking about sugar in fruit, because fruit um, has less sugar for, for a start, but it also contains polyphenols, which slow the absorption of sugar through the gut wall. So fruit is healthy. Studies all show that people who eat a lot of fruit have a low risk of diabetes. The problem with sugar also is it feeds the bacteria which cause inflammation in the gut. So they feed the bad bacteria. Fortunately, the polyphenols within fruit and veg feed the good bacteria. So there's a conflict between the two. We also know if you have inflammation in your gut, it causes leaky gut syndrome and leads to inflammation in the rest of your body. So factors which increase inflammation, this is inappropriate high inflammation, not normal inflammation. Obesity, sugar, smoking and inflammatory foods like burnt meat. And the combination of um, Excess inflammation and oxidative stress, which I'm going to mention in a minute, can lead to a whole load of chronic disorders, including cancer and dementia. In terms of cancer, it's now known if you have a poor gut health, you are very unlikely to respond to the new biological treatments which are being developed. In fact, this medication for metastatic melanoma showed that poor gut health had a 40% less likely to, of response. Um, how do we improve? I've already mentioned the things which improve gut health. These are the foods which have bacteria in them. We should try to eat one of these most days. Live yogurt, old cheese, miso soup, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, tempuka. Um, there are some situations where a Supplements containing probiotics would be useful, such as if you're traveling, if you're having hospital treatments, if you're on chemotherapy, or just if you um, are concerned about your gut health, if you have symptoms of bloating. So sometimes with a hangover, if you drank too much beer, the feeling of bloating is because you've damaged your gut health. So maybe taking a probiotic would be part of a hangover cure. Um, so coming on to exercise. Oops. It is now completely proven that if you exercise up to over three hours a week, you have a 30% reduction in cancer. And if you have cancer, you have a 30% reduction in the chance of it coming back after treatment. And if anyone's interested in the data, there's, we've written three evidence reviews published in these journals. There, there are some risks with exercise. I don't think this is very common. Um, but people sometimes say, I've heard it said, that it can increase testosterone levels. And in men with prostate cancer, this could be a problem. But this is actually not true. It increases levels for about an hour, and then the body, um, through a process called negative feedback, actually reduces testosterone levels. So in the longer term, men who exercise have lower testosterone. So Mertz, who modelled for the photograph, would have to take extra steroids to get a body like that. And so what the biggest problem with exercise is it can generate free radicals, which creates oxidative stress. When you start to exercise, you develop um, toxins called free radicals, which can damage DNA. Now, oxidative stress is where we have too many free radicals in comparison to the enzymes which control them. In a, in a Western society, most of us have 
a degree of oxidative stress. Things which increase free radicals would be obesity, chronic inflammation, radiation, and carcinogens like carcinogenic meat. And things which impair the enzymes which help you are not exercising, uh, diabetes, psychological distress, mineral deficiencies. So if you have too many free radicals, it damages DNA, which then can cause cancer, arthritis, heart disease, etc. When you exercise, it's very important to train gradually, because if you exercise too much, you will develop a lot of free radicals, which could actually be damaging. It's also important when you exercise to make sure you have a good diet which will enhance the production of the antioxidant enzymes. So in the long term, exercise is an antioxidant. In the short term, it can be an oxidant. Because we, need, we also need some free radicals. Um, they're important for normal signaling processes within the cell. So we need some free radicals. So we need a balance between, for a cell to be happy, we need a balance between the antioxidants and the oxidants. In fact, there's a new syndrome called antioxidative stress, which has hit the newspapers recently. So this is when you take antiox too many antioxidants which mop up too many free radicals, so it leads to a sick cell and can cause problems, including cancer. And this is what the journalists love to broadcast. The reality is most of us have too many free radicals, and that's why mankind has a very high incidence of chronic diseases such as arthritis, macular degeneration, dementia and cancer. In fact, when you exercise, it is recommended not to take vitamin A or vitamin E supplements because it will block the, the body's natural ability to adapt to free radicals and increase the antioxidant enzymes. And they do not improve exercise performance, so you'll end up looking like me over there. Whereas if you have polyphenol-rich foods, not only do they have direct performance-enhancing properties, they encourage the promotion on, and capacity of the antioxidant enzymes. So athletes, if they're training hard, or any of us who want to start training, should have this sort of diet and not take these supplements. Polyphenols also have numerous other health benefits as well as reducing oxidative stress. They just enhance the antioxidative process, make it more efficient. We've just heard they, they reduce the risk of diabetes, they improve gut health, they reduce inflammation, chronic inflammation, and they have direct anti-cancer properties as well. So it's not a surprise that every study ev ever published looking at diet shows that if you eat these sort of foods uh, with fruit, vegetables, herbs, spices, it is linked to a lower risk of cancer. And this is the sort of foods which have polyphenols, particularly if you sprout seeds, shots, beans, even chocolate, red wine, these are all um, polyphenol-rich foods. Some people find it difficult to eat with these foods every day, so there is interest in developing whole food supplements, not chemicals, but whole food supplements containing these foods. And we know this was a study we presented in Australia, which showed that up to 80% of patients with cancer have taken some sort of supplement. So one thing I was invited to do by the UK government was to see if we can investigate if there is some evidence that putting some food into a supplement could improve outcomes. 
So this was a committee which we met for 18 months and we considered lots of different foods with experts, other nutritionists, other doctors, patients, etc. Just like the evidence for sport, it was very obvious that we would not recommend um, antioxidant supplements such as vitamin A, vitamin E, acetylcysteine, unless you happen to be deficient in those vitamins, which most of us aren't, and that we should investigate supplements which just have whole foods but concentrated, so you're having a higher level of that food, especially if you start in the morning as soon as you get up. And not surprisingly, studies of vitamin A and vitamin E um, have all shown, well, most of them have shown that if you take them, there is an increased risk of lung cancer and skin cancer and prostate cancer. This has been well known for over 15 years. So when the press every six months have a headline saying antioxidants cause cancer, it's nothing new. And it's really very, very frustrating to see headlines like this. Vitamin supplements increase cancer risk. Antioxidants hasten the spread of cancer. With pictures of fruit and vegetables. In this one, even an apple. Now, all these studies, because every now and again a new study is published, all these studies are on vitamin E and vitamin A. They're all the same. That's all they're reporting. So, but the public, all they see is the word supplements and antioxidants. And they think that applies to everything, which is incorrect. E even if polyphenols have an antioxidant, direct antioxidant property, which they don't, they have so many other benefits that would completely outweigh any negative benefit. So telling people to not eat anti uh, polyphenol-rich foods is, would be very detrimental to their health. So in the study, uh, after considering many, many foods, these are the four which we decided had the most evidence at that point in time, which was pomegranate, broccoli, turmeric and green tea. And they all have anti-cancer properties which are slightly different, so the hope was they would work together. For the trial, we had to make it to a very high quality assurance so that we knew there weren't any contaminants and the level of polyphenols was, was high. And we used, initially it was designed for any cancer, but the first trial examined patients with prostate cancer who were not on any other treatments. So even after six months, there was a highly significant difference in the marker of cancer between placebo and uh, the, um, the polyphenol-rich supplement. So that was highly statistically significant. Um, that year, 10 studies were invited to present at the world's largest cancer conference in Chicago, and we were very honoured to be one of those. Which shows that doctors are interested in this data as long as the trial has been conducted properly with government uh, supervision and independent auditors, etc. They did question whether it could just affect the PSA and not the tumour, which is not true because it, pony, pony tea contains no oestrogenic elements which could do that. In any case, we then did a further study correlating PSA with the tumour seen on MRI, and there was a 100% correlation. Um, we're delighted if you go onto the world's most prestigious website called National Cancer Institute. On the first page on recommended diet for prostate cancer, um, the POMI T study is featured. So it is well recognised as a legitimate source of evidence. Future trials with this supplement, 
many cyclists are taking it and we're currently doing a study to see if it'll improve um, performance in elite athletes. Also in the study, men reported um, there was an improvement in their waterworks and also a reduction in joint pains. But because we didn't, um, it wasn't written in the protocol, we couldn't publish that. So we're planning a new study just to record um, urinary flow in men taking pomite. We feel the mechanism is a reduced inflammation in the gland. Arthritis is a big problem after cancer due to the hormones many men and women are given. Uh, so this is another current study, so there's three current studies, looking to see whether the ingredients of POMI T plus or minus a probiotic could prevent arthritis in patients with cancer. This is a, well, this is a, a, a study we're presenting this year in Chicago, um, if it's still on. Um, three conferences were cancelled last week, so you never know. What we're trying to show is these ingredients um, might have a cancer preventative effect. To do a study of POMI T to protect you from cancer will take 15 years and cost millions and millions and millions of pounds. But we can look at uh, data sets which have asked patients whether they eat regularly the ingredients, the similar ingredients. Um, you may remember, does anyone remember a trial six months ago saying tea caused prostate cancer? I don't know. If... So in response to that, we looked at 155,000 men which had been followed for 20 years and asked their dietary habits. And then you looked at which men got cancer, no, men and women, which men and women got cancer and which didn't get cancer. Well, this, this was men, this is men. We were pleased to report that if you... For every two cups of tea you drink, you had approximately a 3% reduction in the risk of, of prostate cancer. So tea protects you from cancer. Um, this is what the statistician gave me based on what was on the questionnaire. Sorry, this was tea. This was all tea, not green tea. Yeah, sorry, this shouldn't be... Yeah, this was all tea. Um, this data set, it, you have, it takes a two years to apply and you have to say um, one or two questions. Um, I was only allowed to ask tea and broccoli. The coffee has already been analysed by someone else and that's beneficial for bowel cancer. I haven't said this here but in the paper, if the question was do you drink tea, yes, do you drink tea with sugar? there was no benefit. So sugar negates the benefit of tea. We only showed you get a benefit from tea, but you get no benefit if you have sugar in tea. I wanted to show that if you have sugar in tea, it increases cancer, but the, the statistician said you can't say that. Not, not yet. We did the analysis. We wanted to do the analysis of all the ingredients of POMI tea, but they didn't ask people if they took turmeric or pomegranate. But they did ask if you had broccoli. If on average you have 15 grams of broccoli a day, you have a 5% reduction of all cancers. And that's excluding all other factors, like whether you exercise, smoking and things. Yeah, so, so that's um, going to be presented this, this year. We've also done other studies on polyphenols, um, but looking at other properties, we know within essential oils there are polyphenols and phytochemicals. Um, this is a side effect of Taxotere, which is given to many men now with prostate cancer. And this was a simple study which randomised a, a gel which had um, multiple essential oils, very rich in phytochemicals or placebo. Again, we published this last year 
Um, and we were quite shocked that it virtually eliminated this side effect, which happens in 40% of people. And this now, um, because it's a natural product, can't be prescribed, but at least people can buy it themselves if they want, and most people want to. And we're doing further studies of psoriasis and split nails and things. Okay, so this would be a... <laughs> this is the last, this is a typical man who comes to me in the UK with prostate cancer. He has low risk disease, Gleason 7, no spread. But look at all the other medications he's on. Blood pressure, statins, indigestion, laxatives, painkillers, sleeping tablets, antidepressants. So the strategy for this man is not to treat his prostate cancer, but to treat his whole body. So we referred him to a gym, we managed to get him to stop sugar, process meat, reduce his carcinogen exposure. He did take pommy tea, but he also ate lots of polyphenol rich foods. So within two years, we managed to stop all his medication, completely. So he's on no statins, no blood pressure pills, saving over £6,000 a year. And this is a very typical curve I see every day in my practice. The PSA going up, he's referred to us, changes his lifestyle, PSA comes down and stabilises. Even his erections returned because he wasn't taking blood pressure pills and his water works improved. So that's, that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I'd love to hear some questions. If you want to follow um, our research, it's on these sites. And of course, my book summarizes what I've said, plus a lot more. Thank you.